Try and move that out of the way. Uh, so yes, uh, an introduction to cloud computing with Python and Amazon Web Services. Uh, normally known as AWS. It's an introduction uh, about myself. I'm Harry. I'm a software developer. I uh, work for a financial services company. Uh, my day job is Java development, uh, but I'm interested in technology. So come on, please Python me up. Um, so cloud computing, what is it? Uh, easy way of saying it, or simple way of saying it is you're using someone else's computer. So um, computing services are made available via the internet. Uh, Amazon's one of those companies, so you can use their data centers that they have. The uh, purpose of this talk is using Python to run, interact with AWS and automate cloud services. Uh, so why cloud computing, the benefits? Uh, flexibility, no need for physical servers can scale up or down as needed with software. It's cost effective, so you can pay as you go pricing model. Um, before cloud computing, you'd have to contact a data center and put in uh, a request for hardware, so that could take weeks or months to set up. So um, this is much more flexible. Um, and it's also uh, high availability. So AWS is backed by Amazon, so they have, they're a massive company that provides global infrastructure for reliability and low latency. Uh, so why Amazon Web Services? Well, they're the leading cloud service provider. Um, key services include EC2, so that's Elastic Compute Cloud. Uh, so think of virtual machines or computers, really. Uh, S3, that's Simple Storage Service. So this is for object storage. If you're wondering what object storage is, it's similar to file storage, but it's just a difference in how uh, the data is stored. So in object storage, it's uh, stored in a flat structure file storage is stored in the hierarchy. Um, on S3, on the UI, it will look like it's in a, um, a file structure, but that's just really for usability. It is stored in a flat structure. So the difference, one key difference between uh, file and object storage is uh, objects have the, have the data and the metadata like files, but each object has a key. So you're, rather than like a file path, it's a key. Um, the next service, RDS, this is relational database service. So for relational databases, um, you get things like Oracle, MySQL, uh, Postgres on that, um, and then Lambda, so serverless computing. If you haven't come across serverless computing before, that's where you can just put up your code. You don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure for that. So it's, it can be very convenient. Um, AWS integrates well with Python with the Boca 3 library. So this is the official AWS Python SDK. So section two, getting started with AWS, setting up an AWS account. So I've um, put a QR code here because if you don't have an AWS account, uh, you have to sign up for one and you might be putting in, well, you'll be putting in your personal information and then a payment method. So you might want to do that on your phone rather than your laptop. So it's up to you. That's the link for it. Um, I'll just show you what that looks like. Um, since I've already got an account and signed in before, it com comes up to sign into the console, but this will um, link to set up, setting up your account. So it's similar to setting up like an Amazon account. Um, you just put your information and then your uh, payment method. Uh, don't worry about the payment methods. Um, all the demos in this and all the challenges should be in free tier, so you shouldn't be building anything. Uh, the AWS free tier is here. Um, so it's so Amazon give you um, limited periods or limited usage of their services that you can use for free. So this is good for uh, giving you an introduction or just a shot of their services. Um, and AWS has loads of services, so it's useful for not just having an introduction to cloud computing, but also just exploring what services AWS provide. Like they've got ones for machine learning and uh, game tech. So uh, that URL is worth a look. Back to the slides. So you've got an AWS account now. Um, I'll show you what it looks like when you log in. So Amazon AWS has have different ways you can interact with your account. So one way is the management console. So this is the UI, the user interface through your web browser. Uh, you also get the AWS CLI, so the command line interface. Um, and then 
different APIs, so like the SDK, so O3, that's the Python SDK, so the software development kit that we'll be using later on. Um, something to note is we're using, well, I'm using EUS too. You can choose whatever region you want to use, but I just, I just uh, recommend you use that one. Um, what is a region? It's like an Amazon term for an area of the world where they have multiple data centers. So you get two or more availability zones in a region. Uh, in London, they've got three, but they're useful because uh, you can't just have one data center in a region in case there's some natural disaster or a place goes on fire and it goes down. Um, so availability zones are good for resilience really. So in places where there's lots of natural disasters like Japan and Tokyo, they've got four uh, availability zones. So uh, more redundancy there. Um, so this is the link for US too. So to change regions, it's just up here. So you, uh, when you log in, it has a tendency to go to like North Virginia. Um, so I'll just put it on to London. Uh, some services are also global. So uh, we'll go into it a bit later, but it's like IAM and ST there some of global services. But um, so you've logged in, it'll look something like this. Um, this is a useful drop down. So it's just that button here. Um, and Amazon bring, uh, AWS breaks down their services by category. So it's just useful for exploring what they have on offer. And then you can also search as well, which is super useful. <laughs> um, so yeah, that just gives you a, an overview of uh, the dashboard. They've made it a bit more customizable as well. You can uh, add widgets to uh, make it up to your personal preferences. So both Python and both three introductions. So how do you get set up? Well, you install the AWS Python SDK. So do that with pip install both three. Uh, you then authenticate your machine with AWS. So we'll create a user with access tokens and then we'll get the AWS. Well, you don't have to get the AWS CLI, but I recommend you do it just so you can uh, actually authenticate. So you have to do AWS configure and this asks for your uh, tokens, your user tokens. Um, and then you can um, check you're authenticated with uh, this command. So AWS STS get color identity. So um, the CLI is broken down a lot like AWS service name, then method name. So in this case, it's AWS uh, uh, secure token service and then get who I'm calling from. Um, so it should be yourself. So I'll, I'll give you a demo of that creation of the user. So um, you'll have to do this at some point tonight to set up the machine, so it's worth an attention. So you go up to the search bar, I am, so I am. This is for identity and access management. Um, and then you go to users. Um, I've already got mine set up, but I'll just show you what it's like to create one. Just try and get this thing out of the way. Um, I'll do a thread. Um, I just get this provides user access to the AWS management console. You don't have to do it, but it's, it's quite nice for them for you to log in as them and see the UI and then just whatever else you're wanting for this. Like you don't have to say, create that. It's just for if you're like creating this for someone else, they would sign in and uh, reset their password. So you'll have to create a group. So I've already done this, but I'll show you what it's like. So do you create, create group name? Just call it admins and then add this one. So it's the administrator access. So that gives provides full access to all AWS services. Uh, so you just tick that once you've created it, do next, uh, and then uh, create user. And then it'll give you like the sign in URL, username, and password. But what I'm wanting you to do is to go back and then go into the user and go here. So create access key. Um, so this is. Uh, uh, authenticates your laptop with AWS. So just do come up, uh, CLI um, and then go next. Don't bother about tags. Um, and then it gives you the access key, the secret access key. And then what you do is once you've got the AWS CLI, you'd run AWS configure. So I'll just show you what that's like now. Like uh, AWS configure. Uh, and it'll ask, prompt you for your uh, access key and then secret key. It'll then ask you for your preferred uh, default region, just put EUS2. You don't have to put that, but it's just kind of useful. Um, and then it will ask you for your preferred uh, output. So um, you can just put JSON or YAML, but I, I just leave mine blank. I'm not too bothered about the preferred um, output format. So you're set up with 
with that, on to the next one. So I've got a demo of this. Uh, so this demo is really just a, a Python uh, version of this command, AWS STS get color identity. So I'll show you what that's like. I'll show you the script as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, you're creating an STS client. Uh, so that's it there. And then you're doing get color identity. So you can see that that's really similar to this AWS STS get color identity. Um, so I'll run that. Uh, and that's just saying you're authenticated with the following details, my uh, account ID, the arm. So this is the Amazon resource name. So this is like your ident ID. Um, this is useful to have so you can actually identify resources in your account uh, and then the user ID. Uh, so I'll go back to this. Um, I'm just keep it off the full screen because so I'm going to be popping in that a bit all the time. Um, section three is key AWS services with Python. So S3. Uh, simple storage service. Uh, so this is the icon for it. When you create uh, something in S3, you're creating a bucket and that's what you put your objects into. Um, so this is object storage, which I've explained what that is already. Um, and then I'll give you a demo. So it's in the file s3.py and you need a, uh, need a unique bucket name. So S3 is like a global sort of service. So you need a globally unique bucket name. Um, Kind of interestingly, at some point, Amazon has a, had a problem, AWS had a problem with S3 buckets because when you created them, they defaulted to public. So because the, the bucket names are unique, you could cycle through different bucket names and see people's contents of the bucket. So it's much better now when you create a bucket, it defaults to private. Um, you can make it public and you might want to make it public for things such as if you wanted to host a, um a static website on there, that's something you can do with S3. Uh, so I'll give you a demo of that. Um, so, uh, this script uh, creates a bucket with uh, S3. So um, I'll just prove that there's nothing there. Uh, S3. So it just gives me the splash screen so there aren't any buckets. So this uh, script's going to create the SD client, then my bucket name, so I've tried to make it as unique as I can. Um, it's going to upload a file, so it's sample TXT, just the whole world. Um, it creates the bucket, then it uploads the file to the bucket, lists the objects in the bucket, downloads that file from the bucket, deletes the uploaded file from the bucket, and then deletes the bucket. Um, so this is quite good because it's like, it's just guardrails. Like if you deleted your bucket and you still have data in it, it'd be a problem. So it's quite a useful feature they've got just a bit of safety and um, that your bucket has to be empty before you delete it. Uh, so I'll run that. What I'll do is I'll comment out the deletion just so I can show you it actually being created on AWS. Uh, so this is this. So I've put out um, buckets. It's created successfully. The File's been uploaded, um, the objects in the bucket, just the sample txt, uh, file sample txt downloaded successfully. Um, and then, oh, sorry, I forgot to save it. I'll run that again. Um, there we go, it's not deleting anymore. Um, I'll go back to S3, so I'll refresh that. Um, here is so my unique bucket um, sample txt um, and then it's downloaded the sample so it's been created um, well I'll do now so I'm just going to delete it because I don't want it anymore um, so that's it deleted we we'll go back here it will give me an error buckets already been gone uh, in the buckets, so there's no buckets anymore. So that's S3. Um, now we go to EC2, so Elastic Compute Cloud. So the, remember, these are virtual machines, uh, so it's compute so resource. Uh, could be a demo of that. So we'll need a key pair for this. Um, if you're wondering why we need a key pair, it's because it serves a different purpose to the tokens. You need it to uh, create the instance of because um, they're virtual machines. So I'll create the key pair. Uh, 
uh, this thing's getting in the way. Um, and then you um, copy it to the demos folder and then run the file. Well, I'll show you the file first. Uh, EC2. So what this is going to do is create the EC2 client. Um, we have instance size of T2 micro, so this is in free tier. Uh, an AMI, so this is an Amazon machine image. So I've used Docker before, you'll be familiar with stuff like that. Um, it's just basically kind of the operating system and stuff that comes with it. Um, and then that's the key pair that we've just created. Um, it then launches the instance, so you're providing all that, those details that we've given and the key name. So I, that's why I had to copy it over to uh, the current directory so it can actually access it. Um, and then it's going to get the instance running. Describe the instance, stop the instance, uh, wait for the instance to stop, start again, and then terminate the instance. So you get different states for instances when you stop an instance. It's just like stopping your machine, you can start up again. But once you terminate, you're killing it and then getting it deleted and it's getting uh, reallocated to wherever. So um, I'll run that. Uh, this isn't a super exciting demo, I'm afraid. It's just setting up a virtual machine, but um, that's it there. So, so it's giving me the ID. Um, so that's that's it there. So it's starting up. Uh, in one of the challenges, I'll get you to um, create a simple website that you deploy an EC2 instance, and it's public uh, available in an IP. Um, so you have a shot of doing this yourself. Uh, so it's describing an instance, uh, the state of it, public IP address, uh, and then stopping it now. So I'll re refresh this. Uh, so you can see stopping. And then after it's stopping, it's going to start up again just to prove that you can actually start it from stopping. So it's starting it again. Um, and these uh, demos are all part of the uh, talk resources. So like this EC2 ones here. So um, in one of like the warm up things, I'll get you to run the demos yourself so you can have a shot of what I've done. Uh, so you'll need that knowledge to do the challenges. Uh, so it's starting it again. <coughs> Shutting down. And it's terminating it. So that's it. You're cut it off. You're no longer uh, using it. Um, and then once you've terminated an instance, it will stay there for another hour. It's just so you can uh, you can still create it's like metadata and just uh, so it doesn't just disappear from your UI. You know, it's, it's like a useful thing to have. Uh, but you're no longer being built for it. Uh, so that's a terminate dem demo completed. So uh, yeah, this will stick about in my UI for a while. Uh, I'll go back to here. So now going on to Lambda, so serverless function. So uh, you don't have to worry about underlying infrastructure. Just put up your code and it'll run. Uh, so I'll give you a demo of this. We'll need to create a role for this. Um, this is because when you run a Lambda, it's running its own context. It needs permission to actually run, not just uploading the bucket to an SD bucket. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you how to create a role. So you're back into I am. Uh, go to roles and then create role um, under AWS service. We're doing Lambda, do next. Um, and then search Lambda. Uh, let's do this one, AWS Lambda roles. This is the default policy for Lambda service. Uh, role name. Got what I've called it in the script. Just make it the same to make it easy. Uh, my role. So I'll create the role. Uh, go back into it now, and then you get the arm, and this should be the same one I mentioned already because I've tried this already. Yeah. Uh, so that's the like what I mentioned before. It's the ID of that role, so you're identifying what role you're going to use. Um, so to explain what's happening in this script, um, we're finding some inputs. So the function name, the role arm, which we need for permissions, 
uh, the handler, the runtime, so we're running a Python thing. So uh, Lambda supports other languages, like Java is one of them. So how Lambda works is it zips up the code and then uploads that to Lambda. So this is the Lambda code we're putting up. It's just a simple, like, hello world. Um, so it creates the Lambda function. Um, it's creating, putting the code into a zip file um, and then using this Lambda client to then upload that. Um, you can give it input such as a timeout and memory size. Um, and the functions have like a set time to run. It's like cap that 15 minutes. So it's worth uh, knowing that. Uh, and then it's going to run the function when it's uh, up, get the details of the function, and then delete it. Um, so I'll run that. So Lambda create successfully. So I'll go to Lambda. Uh, to show you, uh, it seems like the UI needs just some time to catch up because um, it's already created. So it's the Lambda function create successfully. Uh, response from the Lambda is that, that this is very difficult to read, so I'm going to put this into another file. But that's the describing the Lambda step. Um, so if I put this into another file and then convert it to JSON. Uh, just to call it, yeah, um, and then format it. Um, you can see what sort of stuff it's given. This thing's right in the road. Um, so the request ID, like the response code, so it's all good uh, when you ran it. Uh, and then how it's configured. So like what that roll barn we've got, uh, timeout and memory size, um, and just other metadata really. Um, and also interesting that it sets up uh, logging for you as well. So we'll see that later on for uh, CloudWatch. Um, and then after that, Lambda function deleted successfully. So um, it's probably too fast for the UI really to just didn't refresh in time. If I, um, I suppose I could show you it here. Uh, bit here, just to show you it in the UI. So it's created successfully. We'll wait for it to describe and then we'll, uh, uh, oh, it's because I, I forgot to comment out that, so it's given an error, but it should be okay. Um, I don't know if this isn't, here it is, Lama Island of Function. Um, so it gives you quite a nice overview. You can see the code that we've, we've uploaded. Uh, you can test it in the UI as well. Um, it sets up some stuff for you, like monitoring, like you can get the, manage that over time, like the times you've run it, the durations, like it's useful to, useful metrics just out of the box. Um, so I just wanted to show you that to make you aware of it. Um, right, I'll delete this, just to tidy it up. So that's it deleted, should disappear. Yeah, it's gone. Um, so RDS, Relational Database Service, I don't have a demo of this because it's just a database and um, they take a while to set up, but they are in free tiers, so you can never shop them. Um, just be mindful of what instance you're using because um, these can be expensive to run if you have the wrong instance. Um, so it's the Relational Database Management Service, um, like MySQL and Oracle and those kinds of things. So it's a, it's a useful, definitely a useful service, like it's all managed for you, you don't have to worry about uh, updating and Amazon do all the um, sort of admin around running a database. So it is a very useful service. So section four, best practices and security. Uh, so I am or I am, however you want to pronounce it, this is identity and access management. Uh, always use I am to manage access to your AWS resources securely. Um, avoid using the root account for API access. So when you first create your account, what you're creating is the root account. So that's like the billing account really. Uh, you don't use that for API access because it's like if someone got access to that, they can wreak havoc on your, um, they can like close your account and stuff. So create dedicated users and roles. So that's what we've done in the demos. Um, cost management, be aware of costs when using services, especially once our free tier um, and use tools like AWS budget and cost explorer to monitor unit usage. So with AWS budget, you can set a budget and then, or a limit. And then um, if you go over or if you're nearing it, it will send you a notification. And then Cost Explorer is good for uh, seeing where you're spending most of your money. It will give you like a breakdown of costs 
So that's uh, very useful. So monitoring and scaling. Um, I mentioned previously about Lambda, <coughs> where it had the logging and the metadata. So CloudWatch is a central place to see all that logging. Um, that's the sort of um, name gives away. So you're monitoring your applications and your resources. Uh, so in the logs, it should still have the Lambda logs here. There is. Um, so you can see the, so it's like all the logins coming in one place. Um, useful features of CloudWatch is uh, one of them, a big one is alarms. You can create alarms based on metrics and then you can create actions based on those alarms. So say your web instance had like higher than 8% higher CPU usage, you could spin up another EC2 instance and ease the load on that uh, instance. Um, or say like you had unusually high memory usage, um, you can send an email to your team to uh, like investigate what's wrong. Uh, the next one is not really uh, application monitoring, it's more like monitoring the uh, your account. So CloudTrail, this is for um, auditing and governance. Um, so I'll show you this, it's just a splash screen, but just to show you where it is. Um, this is useful for just making sure that when you're using your AWS account with other people that there's no bad actors and you know, everyone's um, doing what they say they're doing. It's just good. It's really handy for auditing anyway, because it just keeps a track of uh, interactions with the UI, just the different APIs for AWS, like the UI, the uh, CLI and the SDKs. So that's uh, very handy. Um, so part five, conclusion and Q&A. Uh, key takeaways, cloud computing enables flexibility, cost effectiveness, and scalability. AWS provides a wide variety of services that can be automated using Python and Bolt 3, S3 for storage, EC2 for virtual machines, compute, Lambda for serverless computing, RDS for databases, and plenty of more services for you to explore. Uh, so next steps, um, I'll take questions in a minute. I'll just go through the challenges. So uh, don't go to that link, go to the, uh, user group link. So it's, Can uh, you paste that in the chat? Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. Um, all right, so it's on the Slack. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the challenges, um, they're in the repo anyway, but I'll go over them. So the warm ups to get the demos running on your machine. So you'll have to interact with AWS to get them working. So I'm happy to help if you're needing any need a hand with anything. Uh, challenge one is to automate an S3 backup system. So write a Python script that uploads files from your local system to an S3 bucket daily. Use versioning in S3 to manage ch changes to the files. Uh, like an advanced stretch goal is implement a mechanism to automatically delete files that are older than 30 days. Uh, the second challenge is to deploy a web application on EC2, so create a basic uh, Flask or Django web app, use Boto3 to automate launching an EC2 instance and deploy the web app on it. Ensure that the app is accessible via public IP. Um, and then there's a bonus challenge to get through all that. Uh, no solution for this, so deploy a web application with the database. So uh, here's a hint, look at the AWS uh, Elastic Beanstalk. So I've uh, sent a link to a walkthrough for getting started with Elastic Beanstalk. Just a note on that, you're not paying for Elastic Beanstalk, you're paying for the resources, Elastic Beanstalk provisions, but if you're provisioning small instances that I've uh, noted, like uh, T2 Micro, for example, you won't, you'll won't still be in uh, free tier, so it's just something to be aware of. But uh, this is a, a great um, service to learn anyway, because uh, it's very useful. Like once you set up, um, you just have to give it your bundled code, like web application, and then it will set up everything for you. And you have a UI that you can put in uh, like scaling metrics, such as like um, the size of your op scaling group, you can have one instance to scale up to 10, stuff like that, like that. and it comes with monitoring and uh, graphs and all the rest of it, so it's very useful. Uh, so just a note, remember to delete everything on any restaurants finished to save on any unexpected charges. So although you might be in free tier today, you know, if you leave these things running, eventually they'll run out of the limit, so just be mindful of that. So uh, any questions? Well, first of all, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Harry. That's great. That's so I, I just wanted to ask so between the lambda, so the first one on the lambda function, 
I guess, like, have you noticed any drastic difference, like something that, I mean, for example, I'm relatively new to all of this, but I can see that the performance, and especially of all of this tracking, all of this stuff that you show, I guess even if you don't need the power, right, like, is, is that, like, the biggest advantage of that that you have seen, or have you noticed, like, you know, like, really it speeds up, you know, the way in which you work, or what else have you noticed from that? From Lambda specifically? Well, from both and then from Lambda compared to the regular. Yeah, I suppose like, um, I think Lambda is really handy if you're like on your own. Um, I've worked at companies that they had such a good code to deployment pipeline, I wouldn't use Lambda because it was like you could, uh, they had container orchestration systems. So I'd much rather just use Docker and then have my like application running on an Im uh, image like. In a container but for lambda is really handy for if you don't want to worry about the underlying performance uh the underlying uh, architecture at all like um like some websites i know of um or their entire back end is just lambda functions wow. so it's pretty cool but um but it's like in Vivido, like in docker you would prefer if you want everything like packaged and working together <laughs> yeah i i think um I don't know, it's just kind of my personal preference. I suppose when um, I've kind of worked a lot with Java, so I like to have things all in kind of uh, in the app and then you can talk to the database and stuff like that. But yeah, it's, I mean, it is useful using uh, Lambdas. Um, there is a bit of uh, debate online, like um, AWS even, or how Amazon, one of the two came, came out and said that we've actually reversed our uh, serverless uh, architecture because it wasn't as performant as like a mono repo, um, so that's kind of interesting that they were totally transparent about it. But I think um, lambdas are useful um, for just getting code up and running and doing a task. Like you don't have to worry about putting like a. Yeah, um, then you have to create an image. Or I, I mean, something that surprised me is that you can define it right. Python equals three point six as if it were a variable, whereas in Docker. No, maybe you have to set up the entire machine. Oh, that's good, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you get like um like base images that have like Python and stuff on it, but um I suppose it's what it's like it's a, it's sort of a rubbish answer, but it depends what you're wanting to do. Yeah. Um like I can see like use cases for Yeah, why other works. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, for Lambda code to sit on the server, there's no cost, right? It's only when it's running that you're built, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so there's the other thing. So like you, Harry said, the, you have a website that's mostly static. And then when someone calls a method, it then spins up that little thing. Whereas you know, it and the shuts down as opposed to the yeah, server. Yeah, running on the server. server. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. So I'm just going to throw out from the like very limited use of Lambda. I've had another really nice part is that like you said, you, you set the version number, you just set like equals 3.6. <laughs> also the layers feature is where you can put in like, I want, you know, this package and so because it's not, you don't do pip when you're doing lambdas, you, you don't have that level of control. But the layers thing is really great because people like package up these, the different, you know, installed modules. So you just go in and you find your layer, you define it in your code. And, and then if you need to update that, you just change that number. <clears throat> Yeah, that's, that's, that's great, especially when you consider some people that want to work over Docker, you know, like running and all of these platforms that want to simplify it and then they just make it you know, like more complex or more expensive, whereas here it's just quite straightforward. Yeah. Did you do anything with Lambda and, and Alexa? Uh, no, I haven't, personally. Because that's what runs Alexa, right? Oh, right. Okay. And yeah. Alexa runs on Lambda functions? I believe so. Yeah. I haven't looked at that for a long time, but at one point that's what it was. That's how it ran. Thanks, Harry, for the talk. Um, thank you very much, my colleagues. I'm very new to this um, war. Um, so I guess straight up question I'll ask is, which of the services is your favorite and why? Uh, probably S3. I like how simple it is. Like just, yeah. It's very accessible for everyone. And, um, it's very useful as well. Like I've used it at a um, company in, like the um, where it was a startup. The founder wanted profile pictures. And we just spun up a um, SD bucket, and it was like done in, within a week. It's very, very easy. So um, yeah, probably SD. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And it's like it's great you get those features of the box that you can set up a static website from as well very easily. I see. I think you've used it mostly the jobs or roles you've worked at. Yeah. Mostly. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell me to shut up. I, <laughs> talk about S3 and it being like a favorite feature. That's me too. But part of, part of mine is like I have folks who were had just way too many files, and so we chucked them up in S3. But then because S3 can link to Glacier. We're just another like file source thing, but you can actually set up like lifecycle rules. So like we throw up all their 50 gigabyte, you know, Outlook in boxes, and then after three years, it moves it to Glacier, and we're paying like pennies per per terabyte. I mean, it's it's ludicrously cheap, and we didn't have to do anything. And so S3 was the easy way to get it in there, and then once the rules were set up, it was it's been much easier work. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Nice. Any other questions? In the chat, was there anything? Oh. <laughs> Interest. Yeah. Bruce, Bruce was handling that, so don't worry. Yeah. 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 I have an actual question, I promise. How would you find working with Photo 3? I've never used Photo 3. That looks really powerful. Uh, yeah, I think it's very useful. Like, um, I know the way I see it is like a, just a Python wrapper around the CLI. Um, and yeah, just kind of anything you can do with the CLI, you can do with both three really like um, they're very similar. But yeah, it's it's very useful. Do you, do, sorry, on that, like, do you think if, if when you like, oh, I need to do this, do you automatically think I'll do the CLI, or even if you're not doing like a full Python app, you still like now nah, like writing it in, with you know Python better? Um, but initially, before all main, I quite like to see how like the whole flow works, so I like to do it. Like the UI is great for that, but sometimes just doing the CLI and like uh, seeing how it will work and then doing it in Python code is quite useful. Or just using like the um, Python, uh, you know, uh, reg app, like, you know, like that you can just type in the commands. But CLI, I find just most, I'm most comfortable with that. Yeah. Any, any other questions? No. no. Okay. All right. Um, are there any questions on Zoom? No. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll stop sharing my screen. Right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I guess now the important thing is first to get everyone in Slack, right? So Rob hopefully has fixed the link. I mean that link has always been ours. <laughs> I don't know why. It's but yeah, I think uh, currently you have prepared some challenges, right? Yeah. People, I think you left your uh, code there, but if not, oh yeah, put 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 back. Yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, we after the session, you know, we have some challenges. I think you have said. I don't know if you can give us a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, these are the challenges here. Oh ah, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's can... a warm up one, and then challenge one and two are bonus, right? Yeah, I'll just link. Uh, they are in your GitHub repo, right? Uh, yeah, but I'll uh, just change that link so it's the, the average user group.